Everybody ready? All right, ready? Let's learn how to get a job, huh? Uh, I'm Kelly Call. I uh, graduated from Annenberg with a master's in uh, comm management, I want to say like 91 or something. It's a long, long time ago. Uh, I got an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin. I uh, started work at Lorimar Television uh, right around that same time. And since 1996, I've been uh, in charge of scheduling at CBS. So uh, I put the shows each night and what time and then cancel them, cancel all your favorite <laughs> shows. <laughs> we're, the, we're the bad guys. Um, uh, so thank you for coming. Thanks to our panelists who I'm going to have them introduce themselves in a few minutes. Uh, I've done a lot of panels before, but this is the first time I've ever moderated, so I ask everybody to just kind of bear with me. Um, I want to cover the nuts and bolts of getting a job, keeping a job, office politics, uh, and then we'll throw in some questions about the industry as well. Um, we'll do some Q&A at the end, but also I want this to be uh, informative, but also informal. So if one of the panelists says something that you, know, you, you want a little follow-up, raise your hand. We don't have to wait to the end for some Q&A. Uh, we'll try to make this uh, move along. We'll keep it fast, and uh, you know, we'll have time uh, again at the end for some questions. So with that, let me uh, introduce our panelists, and I'm going to ask them to just uh, kind of quickly say, uh, what they do, some of the other jobs they've had, uh, their relationship to Annenberg, and uh, maybe a little bit about their path. So starting off, uh, Christy Darabont. Hi everybody. Um, as Kelly mentioned, my name's Christy. I am currently the uh, social media manager at Disney Channel unofficially. My real title is manager of product management, which makes no sense. Um, but um, we actually recently shifted from a digital media role to a marketing role, which has happened to me a lot in my digital career. They don't know where to fit social media or digital media, so I've been part of communications, PR, um, marketing, brand, franchise, you name it. Um, but before my time at Disney, um, I was at Nestle, so I actually switched industries for a couple years and worked on the ice cream brands and the beverage brands um, for about two years, also covering interactive media. And uh, before that, I was at Universal Studios for seven years, uh, also primarily focused on um, digital and online marketing, and I was focused on the production and post-production services at the studio lot, so my primary role was to get filmmakers to come and use our facilities. Uh, so now, I'm actually focused on all the kids' networks, so Disney Channel, Disney XD, and Disney Junior, and we get to talk to the kids directly on all of the favorite platforms, Twitter, F Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest. Excellent. Uh, next up, Jonathan Gabay. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I graduated uh, in 2004 with a bachelor's uh, in comm. Um, and since I'm currently now at uh, Fox in comedy development, so basically we're uh, responsible for The New Girl, Mindy Project, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Family Guy, um, all the comedies on the air. Um, and what I do there is basically we're in charge of the creative from the pitch idea to getting the show on the air. Um, previously to Fox, I was at the CW for three and a half years uh, where I worked on all the dramas um, in current programming, which is basically maintaining the creative for all the shows that are currently on the air. Um, and then before that, I did a, a stint at uh, Sony and Fremantle Media in reality uh, before transitioning over to scripted programming. All right, excellent. Next up, uh, Kamala. Is it? Ka <laughs> Kamala. Ah, shit. All right, my bad. <laughs> it's okay, I get it all the time. Kamala K Kirk. Yes, hi, I'm Kamala. Um, I graduated from Annenberg in 2011 for my undergrad. I had my degree in communication with an emphasis in entertainment. And I currently work as a writer, editor over at E! Entertainment. I specify in E! Shows online. So my team and I basically come up and create um, editorial content surrounding our shows, like Keeping Up with the Kardashians, Total Divas, Rich Kids of Beverly Hills, and so forth, um, just to keep our um, viewers engaged, to drive them to the website, to kind of get them to interact with the shows. Prior to that, I worked at Rick D's Entertainment for a while. I did radio scripts. Um, Rick was, he did Kiss FM before Ryan Seacrest. I was also at CBS. I worked in production on the set of The Bold and the Beautiful, a soap opera. And I worked as a celebrity personal assistant for a while while I was trying to make it as a writer. And now I finally have, so I don't have to bring coffee to people anymore. Sometimes they bring it to me. So, it's good. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I forgot to mention, I actually was uh, at Annenberg for Masters in Comm Management, and I graduated in 2008. Cool. That's my favorite. So already what's cool is we have um, people on either side of the digital divide. We have uh, a wide range of experiences, so I think we can get a lot of cool stuff out of this. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, first up, did you always know you wanted to be in entertainment? And if so, was there like an aha moment that you said, I want to do this? And what was that moment? Well, whoever, whoever wants to jump in. <laughs> Um, I actually was um, studying undergrad to do pre-med, <laughs> and then. Um, <laughs> so, so the answer is no. <laughs> and then I um, switched degrees to communication and uh, interned at a film festival for a year, uh, the Santa, the Cinequest Film Festival in San Jose. And um, after being there for about a week, I realized that entertainment was my calling. Um, so after the film festival, I jumped ship, moved to LA, and uh, took a chance. And two weeks later, actually landed a job at Universal. And that happens to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the opposite. Um, I knew that I wanted to be in entertainment since I was a little kid. People would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I don't really know how to explain it because I didn't know there was a job in doing what I wanted to do. So I would say, yeah, I kind of want to be the person that decides like what shows are going to go on the network and when they're going to go and like like what actors are going to be in them and people are like huh I don't think that's a real job but sure that sounds cool so I always knew that that's what I want to do in terms of a moment I don't think there was a specific moment but um, I grew up loving Aaron Spelling shows so when I was watching Beverly Hills 90210 I was like I want to do this I want to be responsible for this and making people feel excited about television so that was me. Um, for me, it was kind of a bit of both. I always knew I wanted to be a writer, but I just didn't know that that was something I could do as a job. I figured, oh, I'll get a real job, and then one day I'll retire on an island somewhere and become a novelist. Um, but as I kind of went on, I started in public relations. I was actually working as the PR assistant to the former VP of publicity at Sony, who um, started her own firm. And she represented people like David Duchovny and Jane Krakowski and so forth. And so I worked for her for a year while I was a junior at USC took on smaller accounts, realized I didn't like doing PR and that the only writing I got to do was press releases and I wanted to do more creative stuff. So I took on some internships at, while at USC and then from there they, they, they were just all entertainment based and one led to another and I networked and I just kind of stayed in entertainment and that's, that's where I like being. So. Cool. Mm -hmm. I've got a whole spiel about internships which will probably <laughs> yeah. come soon. Talk about how, you know, nobody took a straight line to where, where you ended up. Talk about how the zigs and zags uh, helped kind of narrow or help you kind of decide where you wanted to get to. My path actually started right here at USC. I was walking down Truesdale and there was a flyer on a tree that said looking for interns. I was like, I guess I should do that at some point. Um, I was a sophomore and I walked, or I was a junior, and I walked over and I grabbed it and it was for a casting office. So I called the casting office and I met with them like a couple weeks later and they hired me like on the spot, which I was like, whoa. And it was for The Shield, which was on FX. And so that was my first experience. Um, in entertainment, I worked there for a year, I interned there for a year, and um, I really liked casting, and I was like, is this what I want to do? And I realized, no, that I like it, but this is not what I want to do, and I really wanted to do scripted, and it, it took a lot of zigging and zagging to getting there, because um, I had also interned at NBC um, in the reality department, because they were hiring, and like, you take any internship you can get in the industry that you want to be in, and um, my boss over there got let go like a couple weeks before my internship was up and I was graduating and so he called me right after, um, right after he'd gotten a new job which was the week before I graduated and said, I need an assistant, I'm starting over in this reality department at Fremantle Media, do you wanna come join me? And that's the dream is you get a job right out of college and so I graduated on a Friday and started uh, in reality on Monday. And that, that does that, not that also happen. happens to everybody. That does not happen. <laughs> that does not happen. So I had to like, I knew I, I didn't want to be in reality and I knew I wanted to be in scripted and it took a few years to really make that transition over there. But, um, and it was, it was hard. 
Okay. Um, well, I had a lot of different internships. I wanted to try out different facets of the industry. I figured all the experience I had would be able to come together and help me no matter what road I went down and give me more options. So after I finished doing my um, PR um, you know, internship, the next one I took on was uh, through USC, through the emails that come in. I just saw one that said Rick D's Entertainment. I was like, oh my god, I know him, you know, from Kiss <laughs> FM back in the day. So I sent an email, and I got a call, and they asked me to come in, and I got the internship. And I started just writing like editorial content for Rick.com, like short little gossipy stories. And then his son, Kevin, who also went to USC and was a few years older than me, noticed that, you know, I had a knack for writing, so he was like, why don't you try writing, you know, the script for my, my Teen Top 20 show on Sirius Radio? Just, you know, do some research, write, you know, let me just see what you can do. So I did, and he loved it, and so then I started writing his script every single week for his show, and then Rick had me, you know, do research for his weekly Top 40, Hot 92.3 FM, his morning show there, and they extended my internship, but unfortunately they just didn't have the means to offer me a full-time job after um, I graduated. So I hopped on to another internship, and I was over at CBS on The Bold and the Beautiful. Um, it's doing everything from picking up lunch for the directors to editing scripts, um, working as a PA late hours on set, answering phones, just doing everything. They gave you the all-around experience. So that was great. But then the thing is, they're a really small company, so everyone has their job for a long time, and there's not a lot of openings, and you start from the front desk. So after that internship ended, I was like, okay, what now? So. I, I saw um, a job listing through the USC UTA emails that come in that said, you know, actress needs an assistant. So I sent in my resume and I get a phone call at night and it's a woman with like a southern accent and I'm, she's like, I, I didn't know who it was, I, I'd applied for so many jobs and she's like, yeah, I'm flying in from New York, I need a personal assistant, um, you want to meet me on Monday? And so at the end of the phone call I'm like, by the way, what is your name again? And she's like, oh, Andy McDowell. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. And so then I met with her Monday at her house in her pajamas. She hired me that afternoon, and I was her assistant for a year and a half. And I started freelancing for magazines, because um, I couldn't support myself alone just doing that. So I did both. And then I eventually, after she moved to Montana, on, to retire on a ranch, um, I got. You know, she she still has a TV show. She's still active in the industry, but she wanted to kind of get away from LA. So that was sort of my opportunity, and then I got the job at E. It was through a recruiting agency. They didn't tell me who it was for um, until you know they saw my resume, and they're like, "Okay, it's for E Entertainment. Um, do you want to go in for an interview?" After a month and a half of like multiple rounds of interviewing, and I totally thought I didn't get the job at that point. I got the call that I got it, and it was like the best phone call I've been waiting for for several years. It was my real like full-time writing job in the industry, and so I do that, and then I write for four magazines. So I'm pretty busy these days, but but it's great. So yeah. Um, I guess mine started in undergrad as well. I actually went to Santa Clara University and I wanted to try a bunch of things because I, after I switched majors to communication, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. So I started um, working on our magazine publication that we had, the KSC Radio, um, and my internship at the film festival. And I was trying different things and through the film festival, it was really small staff. There was probably five permanent staff members and the rest was supported by interns. So we were really responsible for a lot. Um, and the moment that I had to introduce Arnold Schwarzenegger and escort him on stage as he presented some awards, <laughs> thought this is pretty cool. So um, when I moved to LA, I think I applied for 500 jobs in two weeks because I just said, I'm gonna try for anything. I just want something to start, assistant, anything. Uh, I got two phone calls and one was for um, a DVD um, extra feature agency that does those special extra bonus content. They're like, yep, you can fax papers and order lunch kind of thing. Um, and the other interview was at Universal for a marketing rep position. And I thought, if I get this job, <laughs> it's amazing. And so um, many, many interviews later, I also thought I had not gotten either job. Uh, and I got offered both positions and the one with Universal I decided to take. Um, then I started off just doing general marketing, so I was doing a little PR, a little advertising, um, a little communication, internal corp com, and so kind of spread my, my fingers out. And as I went to grad school here, 
I decided to focus my thesis on um, our website because it was very antiquated. So I actually <coughs> focused my whole um, thesis project on marketing to independent filmmakers and how we can do that through social media and our website. I then pitched it to the president of the studio and got the funding to build the website and start social media, got a promotion to online marketing, um, and then was able to, from there, um, leverage that that pathway. So from Universal, I moved over to Nestle. I wanted to switch industries, see if I liked something else, give it a different try. Um, and working on consumer products was very interesting and a lot of learning, but a very different environment. Um, decided I didn't like it. <laughs> and then um, just started, I put my resume out a little bit from Nestle and Probably the first call I got was from Disney, um, and I started interviewing with them about six rounds later. They called me. It was really fast. It was six rounds in about three weeks, um, and they asked me if I would be willing to switch from general interactive marketing to only social media, and I said, absolutely. So now I lead a department um, that focuses on social, and I don't know if I'll stay focusing on social, but for now, I like it. I'm going to let Jackie catch her breath for yeah. one second. You see that? I'm internalizing it all as well. I'm um, living in L.A. Well, the moderator, I'm going, to, I'm going to throw my two cents in about internships. Um, entertainment <laughs> isn't like, you know, you get a, you know, a degree here in entertainment or communications. Um, it's not like being a doctor or a lawyer where you can start going and being a doctor or a lawyer. Um, Entertainment, they want to see experience. Uh, you can have your, your degree, which costs you an awful lot of money, but you're not going to walk in somewhere and just get a job. Uh, internships are really important. Uh, people who are hiring in entertainment want to see you've done something. It doesn't even necessarily have to be exactly what you want to do. And I think you're hearing everybody kind of you know, winnowing around a little bit, and I think that's all part of it. The other cool thing about internships don't even tell you so much what you uh, what you want to do, but a lot of times tells you what you don't want to do, and I think we heard that as well. You might be doing something for six months, and it's like, oh, crap, I can't do this anymore. But it hasn't really cost you anything. You've learned something, and you, you've learned something valuable that this isn't what I want to do, and you move on, and you haven't you know put your whole life on the line going down this path, and it's the wrong direction. So, uh, all right, with that, let's uh, ask Jackie Perez, who's here. Uh, if you could do uh, the, the quick spiel about uh, who, what, where, when. You got it. <laughs> I think that's actually a, get, a great segue in terms of internships and finding out what you don't want to do. And I think when I first started in, in exploring some of my internship options and really who was hiring and the whole cliche of getting your foot in the door, um, I tried, and I think I provided a little bit of this information in my really brief bio, but I started off at a... Um, at Universal Pictures and I interned there. I liked it, but the internship was over, so I had to come back to school. And then as much as I wanted to go back to Universal <coughs> because I actually, I really liked what I was doing, they liked me, there was a need for me, I said, okay, I'm an undergrad, I gotta put on my internship hat, wanna really diversify my resume and try a little bit of everything. So then I got into production and it was the full on, doing award shows. And it was the walkie talkie, standing outside, manning the parking lot for 12 hours, and that was just not my thing. Hated it. Not, not what I wanted to do, but I'm glad I was able to do that and, and learn from it. I uh, went into the nonprofit sector, and um, also my heart was whole, but my wallet was empty. Um, <laughs> but again, I mean, I, I volunteer now for a lot of uh, nonprofits, but, um, but knew that that just was not my career path. But again, learned a lot from it. Um, also interned at nonprofit uh, production company. Oh, and then I um, interned at a talent agency for ICM. I think they're, I think Willie Morris absorbed them mm -hmm. not long ago. Um, so I worked for an agent. She was very sweet, uh, very much a mentor, not like the R.E. Manual character you see uh, on TV. She was the complete opposite, um, really wanted to grow her department. She repped um, broadcasters and uh, reality show talent that was up and coming in, in that time and hosts and she really wanted to start a Spanish language division really had had a lot of plans um, but she just wasn't ready to take me on yet and I was really close to graduation and I knew I needed to start paying loans I could only defer for so long gas insurance kind of life starting to kick you in the butt a little bit uh, and then just the pace having been like an assistant to her assistant 
uh, lots of learning, but just not my culture, not something I knew that I wanted to do uh, long term. So again, kind of checked that box and said, no thanks, thank you, but no thank you. And of course, um, walked away with a great relationship. Uh, ended back at Universal, they had a temp position for me. Uh, and I stayed with their premieres department. So I was doing special screenings and premieres. So coordinating who was sitting where. My job was flipping through People Magazine, who just divorced who, so we don't sit them together, who's doing this and what. Uh, it was fun, but tons of logistics, tons of coordination. And then I started realizing that I'm, I'm good with planning. I'm good with the details. Um, so realized that, stayed with the company, uh, was able to get an admin full-time position in the partnerships and licensing division, going on, um, I think, 10 years now. Oh my god. Oh, now I'm so depressed. <laughs> OK, so going on 10 years now. Um, so started off as an administrative assistant uh, in the promotions uh, account management team. So we did the one-off promotions. So we worked with Kellogg's and Nas for you know, just film promotion. So let's say on here we had the Fast and Furious label. So they're not a long-term partner, they're just the one-off team. Or Kellogg's, we would you know, slap our movie assets and design on the back of a cereal box. So we did those one-off promotions for theatrical and home entertainment. So I was part of that team for quite some time. And then transitioned over, was promoted to a coordinator in the corporate partnerships team, which is no longer a part of, um, of, that, of the division that I'm a part of. But we worked with our longer term strategic partners. So for instance, Nestle was the official water of Universal uh, Studios theme parks. And then we worked with um, Cartier, the official jewelry of Universal Pictures. So we worked with the long term partners. And that entailed either working with them on the Golden Globes, if they were a sponsor of the Golden Globes, or working with them on showcases. For instance, Clay Lacey was the private aviation company of Universal Pictures. Um, so it was account management for those. So we did promotions with them, but they stayed with us for three years, five years, seven years. Um, so did account management for them. And then recently, about a year ago, um, as our group is, is really expanding because of our consumer products business, I'm just getting into that as you were leaving it, um, started with the marketing team. So my team supports our digital productions uh, team. So all of our mobile, te our mobile games, um, all of our console games, uh, we do marketing for them. We do marketing for our licensees. So for instance, I'm on the um, Despicable Me franchise, Minions, Illumination Entertainment. Not sure if you guys have seen the little yellow guys. <laughs> they kind of come out of nowhere. Um, They're my favorite. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I'm on that account that handles um, supporting, I think we have over 500 global licensees. Um, on that property alone. And then we also support our retail development team. So anything that you see in Target, Walmart, um, Toys R Us, Kmart, whether it's US and global, my team handles all of that as well. Um, very busy, no one day is the same, but I'm sure we'll get into a day in the life later. But that's a snapshot. So when our young minions here go yes. <laughs> and go get an internship or maybe get their first job. Yeah. What do they need to do? What do you need to do to get people to sit up and go, oh, I, I want to think about hiring them? Or if not hiring them, getting a boss to uh, invest in you, and maybe your internship is done, and they're going to call a friend on your behalf uh, that they can you know, help keep pushing you along and maybe get you into the system. What do you need to do? Do you, do you hard charge? Do you sit back? What, what's, what's the strategy? Well, in my opinion, be willing to pitch in any way possible, whether it's getting lunch or coffee or actually doing hard work that is part of the department and division that you want to do. Being in the digital realm, I also say that you have to make sure your digital presence out there is very complete and accurate. Specifically, LinkedIn, that is something that I pretty much require to be on the resume so that I don't have to search for what the link is. Um, and give me that really good snapshot and um, you know see a lot of recommendations before I actually have to have calls with people it's just right in front of me um, and I like people to, to ask questions I don't want someone to sit back and wait for me to tell them to do something I want them to show me the interest I off, often check in with my direct reports and my interns make sure that they're busy make sure that they're interested yes you're gonna get some work that's probably not so fun but if as long as you're learning from it and providing me suggestions with how to do it better, 
then I'm good with that. Also, sometimes like you may find yourself having to work long hours. Be willing to stay. You know, don't complain. Be nice to everybody. Mm -hmm. I like to say that today's interns and assistants are tomorrow's leaders and executives. All the people I intern with now have higher positions at different production companies and various places and have we've been able to help each other out in different ways or refer each other for jobs and so forth. And another thing is I found that the USC network has been incredible. Like I've gotten every single internship and job that I have now or have had before through USC. And you may find yourself going to tons of interviews, but view them as good practice. You know, the jobs that you don't get make you better for the ones that you, for the one that you will get. And I find that whenever I go into an office and I'm about to interview and I see like a USC mug on the table, I feel a lot better and I just know that everything's going to be okay. <laughs> I'd echo everything that everyone's saying. Uh, my, my thing would be be aggressive, but don't be too aggressive because I've seen a lot of people come in and be really aggressive and it comes off as entitled and you definitely don't want to have that approach. Um, and just be respectful and be willing to do, you know, 90% of it is going to be the not fun stuff, the, the coffees and the lunches and the setting conference rooms and things like that. But then you'll get to do that 10% that's really fun and different and cool and exactly what you want to do. And it'll all be worth it. I think I'll, I'll also throw in being resourceful. There are so many times I used to um, co-lead our internship program within our division and I, and I had to hand it off this year just because my plate was so full and I just was being a disservice to the program but one thing that I did notice was I kept in touch with the interns and the interns kept in touch with me those that were resourceful where it was something where can you you know run this you know this presentation over to Susie Q and off they went and Susie Q got the presentation and there were others that would come back and say and where does she sit can you point me in the d I don't have time just find out use your resources start networking with the administrative assistants Go into the intranet, find the directory of everybody in the department, be resourceful, <coughs> use your tools, start networking day one. Take notes, we uh, don't want to repeat ourselves. Right. <laughs> right. This all seems like obvious stuff, but <laughs> you would be surprised mm -hmm. uh, at how many interns or uh, kind of entry level hires, quite frankly, get their desk, sit down, and, and it's what are you going to do for me? And that, to me, is really the wrong vibe to give off. Yeah, another thing that seems obvious is dress appropriately. Um, the, in the last year, I've seen interns come in at Fox dressed in short skirts, uh, tube tops, um, guys wearing shorts, and literally had one girl uh, talking on the phone with her mom with her legs up on the, on the, on the table. So I know that seems obvious, but I'm just going to say it. <laughs> I, th I think that's a good point too. It's it's entertainment, and in a lot of places, uh, dress is pretty loose. Yeah. I'm, I'm wearing a suit. I never wear a suit. I wear jeans and <laughs> my shirt on top, but I, I wanted to be respectful. Uh, but but it, these are these are businesses. These are professional organizations. So right, right. Where it, and I've I've seen it as well. Where you know I'm, I'm filing something or working on a big project, and I want to pull you, but you're wearing the six inch heels, mm -hmm. and I just I'm discouraged from even doing that. So I'd rather just do it myself. Yeah. And I was going to add, um, you know, maintain a sense of professionalism, especially in entertainment. There are chances you will see well-known celebrities or famous people coming into your office, but you have to kind of maintain a respectful demeanor. You know, don't go chasing them down for an autograph or, like, not work because you're just so excited to see them. I mean, you know, you may get a chance to interact with them, you may not, but you just, you want to make the experience professional for everyone involved, and you're there to do your job first and foremost, so. it's a really good point. And definitely network, but know your boundaries. We've had some interns who immediately start emailing the CFO of the company mm -hmm. and set up lunches and they're like, who is this person? Why are they? And then the chain goes down and you're get, you get the call of why is your intern trying to meet with me? So network with especially your peers on the intern level. I know Disney specifically has a really good program where they get you together on a regular basis. Um, and then, you know, talk to the person that you're interning for about what's appropriate and who they're comfortable with you reaching out to so that you don't make any relationship mistakes. Great points. What happens on an internship or entry level job? You make a mistake. You screw up. You go, oh my God, my life's over. I've done this. I'm not here. I got my dream job or I got my first job and uh, I'm going to lose it. And your boss can either, and I've had both of these, scream at you, don't you know what you're doing? Or uh, you know you could have handled that a little better. How do you handle criticism, and what's the best way to, to move on from that? Uh, in my opinion, 
admit your mistake and come with some kind of solution. Yeah. That's the best way to approach it because I want to know you've thought about it and you're not just saying I messed up, fix it for me because that will at least show that you understand that there was a problem and you're thinking beyond just the problem, you're thinking about how to make it better. And if you get yelled at or criticized, it doesn't mean the person hates you, they don't want to fire you, they probably forgot about it 20 seconds after you left their office. So don't let it get to you, like it happens. People get really stressed out mm -hmm. and sometimes it's so easy to take their stress out on you because why not? And they can't yell at their bosses and they can't yell at anybody else so they'll yell at you but it's just let, just let it go and move on. Yeah, and I think depending on the scale of the mm -hmm. error or the F up, um, I like to do a, a pause and learn once we fixed it, which is what, what was your thought process, what was your thinking, and what, what can we do different next time so that doesn't happen again. Yeah, basically just accept responsibility. Luckily, um, for me, like if, you know, if I make a mistake in an article, I can quickly you know, edit it and republish it, but at the same time, I work in journalism, so you have to be careful and you, know, you learn from the mistakes you make and try not to make worse ones and just always double check your work and make sure that your, you know, your, your sources are correct because there's nothing more embarrassing in the journalism industry than getting your sources incorrect and then publishing you know, in wrong material, so. And it's okay to make a mistake. Every single one in here is gonna make a mistake, or two, or 10, and it happens. It's happened to everyone, and it's okay. And that's how you learn from things. And you know, some, for my interns, when they make a mistake, I'm like, okay, well, this, this was a, a mess up. Here's how you should do this, and here's how you should approach this, and just use it as a learning experience. We'll come back to job stuff in a second, but uh, let's, let's do a little industry fun. Um, creative and marketing and sales used to be kind of distinctly different camps. Uh, there were the creative people who would you know, come up with the TV show, and the marketing guys were on a different floor, other side of the building. Uh, they didn't talk to each other. And, but that line is really blurring these days. Um, uh, from uh, you know a, a, a Coke showing up in a TV show, or on the panel of American Idol, or uh, the cars that they're driving on Hawaii Five O. Uh, this is all blurring quite a bit. Uh, tell me about um, how that may have changed for you in the last few years, or uh, just how it works uh, where where you work. Social media, as you know, it touches everything and people in the company realize that and want to be part of that. Our Disney Channel Facebook page has six million fans. That's not a small number. So I have weekly meetings with ad sales. I have weekly meetings with programming. But everybody wants from the records group putting out a new CD to our, our DCP, which is our consumer products, with their newest Teen Beach movie costume. They all want to have some kind of support on our social networks, especially since teens are such a really big focus um, in anything <coughs> purchase. Um, so the line is definitely blurred. And as I mentioned, I just two weeks ago got moved from digital media to marketing because that blur is still there. There isn't that clarity of where this thing called social should live. Um, so I'm helping define it for the company. I was the first social manager it, at Disney Channel um, to date, so I formed my job, I formed our department, and I formed our purpose. And so synergy, that famous word, <laughs> is one of the biggest things that we actually do. Um, it used to be where I, I'd be working on a show and I'd only be worried about the creative. And now it's a good example as we're in pitch season right now over at uh, Fox, which basically we're hearing 12 to 15 pitches a day from writers coming in for three months. Tell, tell everybody what that is. Uh, so pitch season is basically uh, writers uh, Writers come in with ideas through studios <coughs> and are this is they're pitching their series, they're pitching characters, they're pitching what their pilot is going to look like and they're hoping that we're going to buy the idea. We usually end up buying 50 to 60 ideas depending on the year out of three or four hundred pitches that we'll hear and all of those writers will develop their scripts, uh, write outlines, write character pages, and then ultimately write the script. My job is to give them creative feedback and shape the script into something that we would want to shoot. Um, at the end of, when we get all those scripts in, we evaluate, you know, we'll read all 60 scripts and evaluate, well, which are the, which are the best ones that we want to make. And, We'll decide that based on is there talent attached, who the writer is, what credits they used to have, um, and we'll we'll go from there. We'll choose eight or nine to shoot, and so that all of a sudden that's 
casting and hiring writers, uh, I'm sorry, hiring directors and locations and all that stuff. But now I have to think about, can I market that show? Is that show something that fits into our brand? Rather than just thinking about creative, it's can we launch the show in an age where everyone's watching everything on Hulu and downloading things on iTunes? Like, is is a show about a cop with Andy with Andy Samberg? Is that is that going to do well? And those are the kind of things that we have to, to think about. And then once we get the shows on the air, all of a sudden I'm thinking about promo. Like, how many ads are airing during the week. Do people know that the show is going to be on? Not enough. Not enough. Never and enough. So you have to call your promo guy and be like, that's not really selling the episode. And so all of a sudden, it's not just creative, it's everything associated with the show. And the show lives and dies with you. And it's a huge responsibility. And you have to remember every little thing about it. Like, uh, I mean, you're getting standards notes because you can't say curse words or you can't show too much sex on the air and all of a sudden you're in charge of calling the producer and being like you have to edit this and it just there's so many different things that that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis on a series that you didn't have to really deal with five six seven years ago including social media we worked with show creators actually all the time before the show's even on the air now we meet with them tell them our strategy and try to figure out a process to get assets right away so that we have it to lead up to the show for Wow. Um, the world between, I guess, um, marketing and sales, to your point, very much blurred, and I see that every day where I purposely went down the path of account management. Um, I'm very tactical. I'm very action item oriented. I like getting the deal and then making it happen. Um, but what I'm seeing more and more now with our sales team, before they go out to, I don't know, let's say Walmart in Mexico and pitch this huge idea for minions next year, well, they need assets. They need to create the deck. They need to secure the costume characters to go down into the meeting space to give a little more energy to the pitch. Um, they need signage. They, I mean, they need a ton of stuff, and that's something that, that my <coughs> department handles, so I have to work very closely with them, sometimes go into the pitch meetings with them uh, to see that. But it's, I used to fight it a lot, thinking, no, I am account management. I am not sales. That is all you. That I'm, I'm over here. You just hand it over to me, and I cook it and make it happen. But it's, it's not working that way, but that, that's okay. I'm exercising another skill set um, that I didn't think I had, that I didn't think I would embrace, but I think it's part of the ever-evolving, never-stop-learning, always continuing to be open um, to new challenges, and that's what I'm seeing in my department. Um, over at E, we're all intertwined. Um, I may work in the editorial department, but I'm you know, copied on emails and communicating with everyone from celebrity publicists to our news department to our social media department. And, you know, I have lots of meetings every week. Um, my team and I get together every week and we'll talk about the shows that we have on air, like Total Divas, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, and come up with new fresh ideas to try to create content that will drive people to our website. And then we'll also, <clears throat> you know, meet with you know, the talent and do, do interviews or shoot video segments to film. And then I also write for Fashion Police. Um, in the wake of the whole, you know, Joan Rivers tragedy, um, we've had to make some changes and kind of pause production. So right now I'm the writer for all the fashion pieces. And I have to be careful with, that, with what I write and make sure that, you know, celebrities, publicists will be okay with it because sometimes you can, you know, offend someone if you critique their fashion too much or, you know, you get emails and so you just have to kind of be willing to kind of go with the flow. Um, but then also whenever we, you know, create stories, we send them out to our social media team so they know everything that's being published every day so then they can tweet about it or pin about it, you know, Facebook it because we have Facebook, numerous Facebook pages for all of our shows. So we're going out on a lot of different platforms so we all have to kind of stay connected, communicate what's going out and that way we can all help support each other. So. All right, so I think what we're hearing here is that, you know there aren't real clean lines anymore. If you're uh, involved in creative, you're also doing marketing, and if you're working in marketing or support, you're also doing creative, and uh, it's a lot of people working together. Um, this brings up kind of a, a transition. I want to talk about digital for a minute. Digital is the thunderbolt that uh, hit us a few years ago. It hit music, it's hit movies, it's hit television. Um, Kamala, Christy, your jobs basically didn't exist a few years ago. Uh, Christy, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Jackie Jonathan, uh, you're dealing with digital rights, DVR. 
What, what, what does everybody here need to know about the digital future and how it might affect their ability to uh, get ahead in the industry? That's a big, big question, but I'm just curious <laughs> what you have to say. I can start. Um, <laughs> I, the biggest problem that I face is that everyone thinks they know how to do social media because everyone uses social media on a regular basis. Professionally, it is a much different beast. We have to plan ahead, sometimes months ahead, if not um, at least on a weekly basis. Everything is rounded to at least five different stakeholder groups. Um, we have S&P and legal, <laughs> look at everything. Um, we have a graphic designer who actually makes sure our images look not too professional, but professional. Um, and so I caution you to feel like you can do social media just because you have used Facebook on a personal basis. I did not have the luxury of studying anything digital or social when I was in school. Um, and now I think it's such an amazing opportunity, especially with the new building, all the technology, to be able to use that and see what that really means and, and how that can be part of your, your work life. Um, the other thing you need to be aware of is to be diverse. While I focus on social, I also understand the impact of what that is and how that's part of an integrated plan. Um, and social changes all the time. You know, Snapchat wasn't a, a big thing a, a few months ago even. So I have to be flexible and I have to be <coughs> uh, willing to negotiate and turn on a dime really on what our strategies are. So. Um, if you're interested in digital, be, don't be set on something being your future. Be willing to change. Clearly, as I mentioned again, my, my group just changed over to a different group, so I have to always be willing to adjust to whatever the scenario is in the digital world. I think it's actually pretty cool that, like, you know, years ago we didn't really have to deal with that, but that's in your everyday. It's like normal for you guys now to. You know, see a show and then have a hashtag at the bottom of the screen. Like that's normal. We, that didn't exist <coughs> six years ago. So I think that's really, I think that's really cool that you guys are getting into the industry at the time where it's really booming. And I think just understanding how it's impacting whatever business it is that you guys want to go into, I think is going to be really important because every single company is so focused on digital right now that. If you come in and understand how it impacts their business, whether it's positively or negatively, I think you'll have a leg up on other people that are trying to get jobs and working in that industry. Yeah, I would very much agree with that. And then just one thing to add, I was very impressed with, and to your <coughs> point, if you want to post something, it really takes like five layers of approvals to do it. I think to this day, I'm still very impressed with how, how much we guard our social media. Um, I mean, being Comcast and being part of that larger umbrella and knowing the power that that at least some of these conglomerations have. And so knowing that and being very careful with what we push out, with what we blast out. We have so many licensees, so many retailers, so many promotional partners coming to us and saying, oh, we have the greatest you know, uh, packaging that has your product. Why not blast it out? Your fans would love it. But nope, there, there's a larger strategy. It's not just about posting and pinning and every, there's there's a thought process to that, and to your point, if you come in understanding those tools and then bringing value to the company and knowing how to apply those tools to move the business forward, you're you're a definite asset. Mm -hmm. And for me as a writer, you know, I work in both print and digital media, and so there, you know, there are a lot of differences between the two. <coughs> Obviously, writing for online, you know, you may come up with a great title for your article, but you have to think, will people click on this? And we do a lot of SEO, which is search engine optimization, which is where you know certain keywords or names together will get clicked on more. So for us, it's about getting a lot of clicks. So it's not that your content has to be, you know, any less good, but you just have to kind of shape it in a way like a catchy title or a good thumbnail. Which which is like the small picture that people see before they click on an article. Um, one thing I do like about working in digital media is the immediacy of it. You know, I can churn out multiple articles a day, they're published immediately. It's eco-friendly, which is another way of looking at it. And um, 
you know, if you make a mistake or you have a typo, you can go in and republish it, whereas when you write for a magazine, you know, once it's out, it's out and that's it. But, you know, uh, publishing in print also has its benefits. Like, I love seeing, you know, an article I write in an actual magazine on glossy paper. And, you know, they say that the print media is dying, but I think it's going to stick around for a long time. Just may not be as popular, but, you know, it's still present, so. <coughs> I think the rules that we all assumed five years ago, ten years ago, every, you know, when I, when I do talks like this five years ago, I'd say, you know, things are going to change. They're, they're changing right now. Uh, the way we uh, exhibit TV shows, whether we stream them or hold them or air them three days later or seven days later, uh, everything we thought we knew a few years ago or, you know, smart people say they thought was coming, eh, it, it never goes the way they think. Uh, but it's almost always driven by business. Um, we all work for big companies. Uh, we're all driven by the bottom line. So, you know, never, to me, never forget that there's got to be a business reason why we do all these things. And usually most of these rules change and move uh, to try to uh, take advantage of the marketplace for these, these companies we all work for. I wonder if overall it'll shorten everyone's attention span. Everything is so quick, everything is a sound bite, everything is a headline. And I mean, this is, maybe I'm throwing it back to you, but um, I don't know, I just sit and wonder sometimes. I think it does. I mean, over at E, you know, we have kind of a limit on our articles. You know, you write them short so that way people click on them, they get the information, they go to the next, and you just get them clicking and clicking and going and going. And, you know, even in our articles, we'll link to other ones so that we, we, we our goal is to keep you on, you know, on our website and keep you engaged. And so the longer we can do, the better, but we have to work with a shorter attention span. Right. So, so going yeah. for, I guess, the breath. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we, we've all had a number of jobs. So you're, you're now out in the job world, and maybe you've got the first job. Um, when do you move on? When, when do you know? And sometimes it's easy. Sometimes the dream job comes along for three times the money, and that's a no-brainer. But what, what's the little voice inside of you that says, all right, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to the next thing? I, I was actually just thinking about that over here on, on my way to, oh my god, 10 years. I had a long drive, so I had a lot of time to think. Um, so when I, when I started, I guess 10 years ago, um, I remember giving myself a timeline and saying, okay, after year three, I'm going to start looking, keep myself competitive, maybe go to another studio, which is what you see a lot on resumes. Uh, three years here, four years here. Um, but, but my three-year mark was in 2008. And that's when it all hit the fan. And I remember very clearly we were owned by General Electric at that time. And Jeff Immelt, the head of GE, came down to Universal and did what they call a town hall meeting. And he was giving us the play-by-play -play of when the White House called him and said, the dollar is about to crash tomorrow when AEG uh, files bankruptcy. I mean, it was huge. And I'm thinking, I am not going anywhere. I am holding on for dear life. And I'm glad I have a job. But it was that type of, uh, of environment in 2008 where it's like, stay not the time to be experimental, not the time to hop around, stay. And, I, and I've stayed, but it, it's really worked to my advantage where the, the, my department's gotten so big, I've been able to, to hop around within my division, and I think that's why I haven't, I've continued to stay challenged, I haven't, I haven't been bored yet. Um, but I've been lucky enough to have those opportunities to move around. So I think that, that's my... I think once you identify exactly what it is you want to do, stick to it. Um, you know, uh, last week, in fact, I had an opportunity, um, I got a job offer to go work for a producer, which basically would have transitioned me from working at a big network to becoming a producer. And I really thought about it because you know, I've been at Fox for a little over two years and I've learned a lot about the comedy business, but I thought back to the 12-year-old who was trying to explain what he wanted to do when he grew up and it was work at a network and work in scripted television and I felt like that's what I want to do, that's what I should stick with. Now if you get an opportunity to elevate that, then you have to think about your position where you're at currently and how that's going to change and sometimes it's even as small as like I like the people I work with here and you, sometimes you can't trade that, it's quality of life and you have to think about things like that too um, because it's it's if you go to another job, that's where you're going to be working for the next year. Are you going to be happy? Are you going to be miserable? And if you're happy where you're at and you're happy with what you're doing, you really have to evaluate that as well. I think um, my experience in all the studios and corporations I've worked for, each department is really small. My team right now is three people, 
running three network social media accounts. So the, the time that I realized I had to move on at, at Universal was that I had no more opportunity for growth. They can't just make you promoted because you've been there a certain amount of time. There has to be a business need. So when you've gotten to the point where you, haven't, you can't learn anymore and you can't contribute and you can't reshape what your job is, I think it's time where you need to see where you can get to that next step, uh, whether it's just a lateral move or something else, but where you can still learn. Because a lot of times you just get stuck in these small groups and unless someone leaves because they're there forever, it's really hard to move up. And you know, I'm, I imagine all of you are similar minded as I am of having a career path and not thinking you want to just stick in one job. You want to move up um, through the years. So it, it's a challenge and it's an unfortunate one, especially when you like your team. Um, but luckily I've been fortunate enough to stay in, in companies for over seven years. Um, and then the other thing is, it does get to the point, uh, in the digital world at least, agencies, they they look at your resume. If you've been somewhere over a year, they're like, what's wrong? <laughs> All my agencies, I had turnover of producers and project managers after about a year. And they, if you want to be a digital, they kind of like expect you to keep learning and having new roles and, and expanding what you're doing. So if that's the area you're going in, you have to kind of keep that in mind. I haven't found that to be an issue for me, but that's also because my jobs change as I'm in them. So <clears throat> I'm lucky enough to be able to experience that. And in my industry, <clears throat> it's kind of different. You know, it, it, it's ideal to stay at one place for a couple of years, build your experience there, and then move on. Typically, we'll have people who work as an editor for, you know, three, four years, then they'll move elsewhere, like Entertainment Weekly or various websites and magazines. Um, it just kind of depends, but I feel that there's a lot of opportunity for growth and, you know, it, sorry, I just totally blanked out. <laughs> uh, sorry, long day. Um, but yeah, so. Generally speaking, um, companies will pay you as little as they can. Uh, they'll promote you when they have to, uh, and usually that's when you threaten to go somewhere else. So your, your, your biggest jumps in salary, uh, title, uh, sadly, usually come when you leave the company and go somewhere else, or threaten to leave the company and go somewhere else, mm -hmm. and then you've got a little leverage back with your company. So, so you know, being happy is a big part of it, but you know, everybody wants to get paid too. So. Oh, no, I just gonna, I remember You're now. back. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, within a company too, there's opportunities to move up. Like you can be associate editor, executive editor, senior senior editor. It can take longer to get some of those positions, but they pay more, and you're doing more management. You may be doing less writing and overseeing a team of writers. But some people choose to stay at one place, which is you know kind of what I want to do and work my way up. Or you can also, if you're tired of writing for one place, you can go elsewhere, work your way up. You know, there's a lot of different options, so. Mm -hmm. Sure. Oh, yeah. um, so I had a question then, because you were talking about uh, threatening to leave and things like that. So would it be the same for when do, you, when do you decide to negotiate and when do you decide to leave? How do you know your worth in the entertainment industry? Because it's such a hard entertainment, like, it's such a hard industry to get into. I, I, I would say uh, the the newer you are, the less mm -hmm. negotiation right. room yeah. you have. Um, <laughs> if, yeah. It seems obvious. If 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 you can be replaced uh, in ten minutes with a phone call, you don't have a lot of leverage. Your 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 first job, you're, you know, they're going to say, "Here's what we're willing to pay you," and yeah, maybe you can squeeze an extra couple grand out of them. And also, you you'll know based on so I, I, again this happens literally happened to me last week like you, you got a job interview and you got a job offer and you go to your boss and you're like I got a job offer if they're like cool like you should like you should take it or something like that you should probably take it. <laughs> um, if they're like well let's talk about it and then like they get somebody else involved then you know okay they want me to stay so then you have to decide okay what do I want to do and so you have these two options. So you sort of like, you sort of like, you feel it when it's happening. Like, you can't, I can't really like tell, there's no like right or wrong decision because it's such, such a case by case basis. You get a sense. You get, right? you get a sense yeah. of like what you should do based on how, based on the job offer that you got. Like, was it the a money that you were looking for? Is it the title you're looking for? And then based on the response by your employer, like, you, you, you'll know. 
like that. Uh, I don't know. It's poker. It's poker. It is. Yeah. It's a. It's kind. It's a game, and you have to play the game sometimes. I have a, a question about like within the entertainment industry. Then, say you're switching from music to television to digital or something else. Do you have to start at the beginning sometimes? Like, say you you went from Nestle to Walt Disney. That's such a huge jump. Like. When do you know, like I said again, like your worth and what to take and where to start? In my case, um, <coughs> first of all, I would never go to the table to my boss with an offer if I didn't know the outcome I wanted. Because usually I go because I am ready to leave. It's not because I got some chance recruitment. Um, and so unless, it would have to be a nice package for me to want to stay. Um, but it's always nice to at least feel like they want you to stay. <laughs> um, when I switched industries, I'm very lucky because my skill set is really transferable. So you can market yourself knowing social media or digital media, and it doesn't really matter what you're marketing. The thing that I had to keep in mind was I had to be passionate about what I was marketing. So. I loved working with filmmakers when I was at Universal. I loved talking to independent filmmakers, big filmmakers. It was something I absolutely loved. <coughs> at Nestle, when I was working on ice cream, I loved that. <laughs> <laughs> then they moved to, I transferred to, to the beverage division, and I just wasn't, the passion wasn't there for me. And so I had to make a judgment call because I was paid really well in that industry, and I had to make a decision if I wanted to go back to content that I was really passionate about and possibly sacrifice the, the pay, um, but I did leverage that to get equal pay at Disney, which was great. Um, but you just have to know what you know and be able to say to market that your skills will translate to either music or whatever division you're going to. Sometimes it's pretty specific, so it's hard to do that. And you would have to take either a lateral move or possibly start from the beginning. But at the same time, if it's skills that you really can translate, then you can leverage that. Uh, well, I'll come, well, hang on, hang on. Was, <laughs> that, that was a, we'll come I'm right just, to you. I'm just going to add one more thing. I think, I think, uh, for, for me, I think uh, you have to have the expectation of starting at the bottom if you're going to switch completely. Like, um, I, as I said, I started in reality and I worked as an assistant in reality for three and a half years. And at one point they were going to promote me and I was going to get to be an executive, which was the dream. But that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in scripted. So I took a job. I moved laterally as an assistant. I took a job in scripted and I was an assistant for another three and a half years until I got promoted. But that's what I wanted. And now I'm happier than I could have ever been, and I don't think I would have been happy working in reality. So if you, if you really feel passionate about what you want to switch to, then having the expectation that you might start at the bottom, it, you just have to understand that going in. I see a lot of people, like I have friends who are lawyers who are 30, who hate their jobs, and then call me and they're like, I want to be a writer. And I'm like, okay, well, you're going to be a PA or an assistant, and if you're making 100 grand now at your law firm, you'll probably be making 20 to 25 grand. Are you okay with that? And it's going to take you a long time to move up. So and they probably say yes. And they do. And they do. Even, even within TV, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm about as high as you can go in scheduling, but if I wanted to do comedy development, you know, they could make me head of comedy development. I would have no idea what I was doing. It would be a disaster. So, um, so I would have to take a step back. So. Good depends. reality show to document that, yeah. though. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, lightning round question because they really wanted me to ask. Um, any alumni, professional organizations, school organizations that have been valuable to you um, in terms of networking, job leads, making friends, uh, anything like that? Uh, well, I'm, first of all, I'm a mentor for Annenberg, so uh, that's a great way to meet other mentors. There's like 120 of us or more now, and uh, you're able to meet people not only in your industry but across industries who are very um, good to leverage in the future for your career. Um, also, I am in plenty of digital groups across LA. Um, I am a consultant for ANA for uh, marketing uh, when they do their summits and things like that, um, and whenever I get a chance to speak on panels, I always take it so that I can meet new people. I did, I, very different, I just started as a mentor. I've had like one session with my mentor, my mentee, but um, that, you know, that 
post about an internship on the tree at USC, that was I, I that was great and, and that really helped me. I didn't have the luxury of like these panels and like I didn't hear about them. I just seemed to have missed everything. And what, when I was starting out and trying to get connections, I um, I would not recommend doing this all the time. But I cold emailed like executives that I had heard of, and a couple of them actually talked to me. And so I try and do the same thing when I get you know strangers <coughs> sending me their scripts or. Um, someone email and be like, can I just pick your brain for a few minutes because I felt like I didn't really have that luxury. So I would say take advantage of it now as much as you can um, and do everything you can to meet people because that, that is how you're going to get your job and your career. Yeah, definitely. Annenberg alumni and then when I was an intern networking within my internship pool, keeping in contact, you had made a reference to now they're, they have full-time senior positions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just making a really good appearance so that you're not afraid to reach out to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, in addition to the USC Alumni Association, which has been wonderful, um, for writers, there are so many different professional organizations you can join. It's almost overwhelming. You can just Google them, and they have everything from you know mystery, you know crime writers. <laughs> organization to, you know, romance thrillers, like depending on what, you know, arena you want to write in. Um, I currently don't belong to any because, you know, in addition to my job, I write for several magazines, um, so I don't have time right now, but I definitely recommend them. They're so great for networking, meeting like-minded individuals who are either doing what you want to do or share similar goals. You might meet your future, you know, book agent or writing partner, you never know. So I definitely recommend get, getting involved. Uh, a lot of organizations like HRTS and I think even the TV Academy have, you know, like these junior programs, which sound kind of corny, but basically they'll let you in for, you know, for no money at all. Mm -hmm. And they have networking things and, you know, great, great places, to, they have panels and also just great places to meet. Yeah, HRTS is great. They, they have a whole junior um, association and um, you meet a lot of people that way. So it's, it's great. Drinks. Yeah. Great. Yeah. What is that, HRTS? J, yeah, it's called JHRTS for the younger people, but um, it's the Hollywood Radio Television Society. I think that's right. <laughs> HRTS. Um, all right, I didn't forget about you, but hang on. Uh, okay, last question before we open it up. Um, what does everybody here need to know to get a job? Um, no butterflies and rainbows, follow your dream. Uh, someone's going to interview in front of them, someone's going to interview behind them. Uh, what are they going to say across the table from somebody that's going to make that uh, potential uh, person hire one of our people out here? Be passionate about what you want to do and like go in with knowledge about your company. And it doesn't mean you have to like sit there and s spout out statistics. But be able to have a conversation about um, whether it's uh, if you're a writer, writers that you like, or what inspired you to write, or if it's TV shows, what you want, even as simple as what you watch. That's one of the main questions that I ask every person that I meet with is, what do you watch? And you really start a dialogue that way. And I think just knowing what your company is doing, what the company is doing that you're interviewing for, is incredibly helpful. Yeah. Do, do your research, too. I mean, I can't stress that enough the times that I've done. Um, intern interviews and we ask one off about oh have you heard of us having signed you know somebody new knowing something that was carried out in the trades and cricket I'm like oh my god that was the easiest Google search you could have done in the lobby and it just wasn't done for whatever reason they were probably concerned about a couple of other things but that's just interview 101 do your research <coughs> yeah I totally agree I, I made that mistake before when I interviewed for a job I was, you know, was at that time when I was just applying for lots of jobs and I was even submitting myself for things I knew I didn't want to do like two years from now, but I'm like, well, if it gets my foot in the door. And so, you know, I applied for the production company that produced like Never Say Never by Justin Bieber and all that stuff. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, I'll just go for it. And so I got the interview and I guess they were starting this new YouTube channel. I didn't even bother to research it. I was like, I'll wing it. I'll be great. And he starts asking me all these questions about like the project. And I, you know, 
I was like, okay, I'm not getting this job. So, you know, just always research, you know, like if it's a network, look up the shows they have. When I interviewed at E, they automatically asked me what my favorite shows on the network are, and they're like, and don't say the Kardashians, so I have other <laughs> shows to say. And luckily, I do watch shows on E, especially now, obviously, but just, you know, know what you're getting into, and be prepared, and, you know, but be relaxed. I, I know it can be stressful, but... You know, when you calm the jitters and you just go in and be natural, you'll you'll do your best. So, I would say don't lose hope. You may have to put three to five hundred resumes out there, and it <laughs> is hard, but somebody will call. Follow up and send thank yous because yes, um, that's great. <laughs> yes, definitely. If, we will remember you if yeah. you actually do that. Um, yeah. Right. Oh, proofread the resume. I mean, <laughs> I, yikes! I'm, I just it hurts so much. I mean, for USC, hello. The period, capitalizing, it's just, it's grammar, basic. Have a friend look it over. Don't be too concerned about it looking pretty. Just make sure that the stuff on there makes sense. Actually, I have one point to add to that. Um, I forgot to mention how I got my job at Universal really quickly. Um, it was because I listed that I volunteered to teach computer education classes to adults that my boss hired me at Universal. She wanted someone with some digital experience and that was basically enough. So don't underestimate the value of the things that you're doing, whether it's nonprofit or volunteer or stuff just through school because it actually will add up on your resume since you have basic um, background right now with internships and, and part-time jobs probably. And, and leave something to discuss in the interview. And, and I mean, and I was guilty of that looking back in like older versions of my resume where I put everything on there and it was a point two font because I wanted everything on there. I didn't want them to skip a beat. I mean, I led everything, but it was just too much and it, some of it was, wasn't relevant. And in hindsight, I should have really cooled it down and left some talking points for hopefully when I scored the interview. But don't leave off Trojans. We run this town, so yes. Yes. <laughs> eventually the person you're, that's interviewing you might be a Trojan, there you so go. don't leave that off. Right. My, my, latest, my latest pet peeve are cover letters that, um, that go a little too far, that tell you, especially on an entry-level job, don't, don't tell me what you can do for me. You, you, you can't do anything for me. Uh, <laughs> I want to know you want to work hard, I want to know you're willing to do the hours, and you want to learn. That, mm -hmm. That's really what I want to hear, that you want to learn and help us out. Don't try um, and schedule a big bang. He knows yeah. exactly where it's going. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, you know, I, you were in a club at school, and that's great, but you, you, you don't know yet. You know, All you right. come in and want to help and, and roll up your sleeves, and that's, that's certainly what I always want to hear. Our, our EVP has a great plaque in her office. Um, it says, be brief, be brilliant, be gone. <laughs> I'm like, I love that. Words to live by. All right, with that, let's let's give a let's just quick round of applause for that. This is all really really good stuff. All right, let's do uh, let's do some questions. We had one back here. Um, I skipped over and I, I apologize. I kind of forgot my question, but um, <laughs> you got the floor, so take it. Um, okay, we were talking about how um, everyone kind of skipped around a little bit, like uh, every three or four years or one year. I want to know if you guys think that we can have long, if longevity is obtainable in the entertainment industry, and like how? Absolutely, um, absolutely. My my boss started out as an assistant, and she's been at Fox for uh, 15 years now, and she's now the uh, EVP of comedy, just all of comedy, and she did not go anywhere else. She just worked hard and loved what she was doing and did a good job at it. And if you want to stay and have a long career, you can definitely do that. You don't have to switch around. There, there's no rule that says to move up, you have to move around, just keep working and be patient and someone will recognize you for that. My boss um, has been at, at Disney for 17 years. He did had different jobs and now he's the executive director of digital. Um, so that's possible. And when I was at Universal, we had something called the 25 year club. Every year we would celebrate 50, 100 people who had been there 25 years or more, um, and they they had just been most of their career there. I, I've had the same job for about 20 years, which is either <laughs> it means I'm either really good or it's really pathetic. Um, but my job has changed, and there are always new challenges, and the business mm -hmm. changes. So a day, you know, like today was not like a day three years ago or five years ago or ten years ago. Um, if you're good and you keep your eyes open within a company, there's always new challenges and there's always uh, there's voids out there. 
and nobody wants to do this, so you know, be the person. Say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. All right, uh, we have one back here. Hey, so I think as undergraduates, we sometimes get lost in the shuffle of like, how do I make my resume perfect and do uh, and all these minutiae details. Um, I just wanted to know about your broad outlook and what you think the industry is going towards like five years from now. Like, there's things like Netflix throwing everyone for a world with like Crouching Tiger exclusive films or Comcast is merging with Time Warner, things like that, and like the broad scale of the industry. I got no clue. Yeah. <laughs> you tell me. From, a your from a consumer point of view, from just a fan of TV, like I think it's awesome that I can um, go on Netflix and binge watch, you know, five seasons mm -hmm. of the same show. But then at the same time, working at Fox and, you know, seeing five years ago when a show would be rated like 12 million people would be watching it, and today a hit is 4 million people watching it, it scares the crap out of me. And I'm like, is Fox even going to exist in a few years? And that's, that's the worry. That, that's the worry from the business side of it and the job security side of it. But um, I, I don't think there's an answer because so it's changing every single day. Um, Disney Channel is one of the first um, groups in Disney that launched an app called Watch Disney Channel. And it's basically like HBO Go. And so you can log on to the app anytime and watch the latest episodes from our shows. And now we even have a function called Replay where it's old Disney Channel shows. So it's the stuff that we all watched when we were kids that's on there. And <laughs> so it's like, but not that long ago people. <laughs> But yeah, it's like now there's two different scheduling groups because there's one for multi-platform that's doing the set-top box, that's doing uh, the watch app and other formats, and then there's the group just doing linear. And so it's definitely going in that direction, and more emphasis is heading on our app than anything else. So where, I think where the business is going, nobody really knows. So in a sense, try to learn as much as you can and be flexible and, and really try to analyze the, the, the reasoning behind the decisions. And when you see yeah. a business go this way, when you see TV shows being streamed or put on Hulu, you know, ask yourself why and try to figure out what's behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, there. Uh, you touched a little bit on the idea of people switching between niches and coming from other industries, like you know, the lawyer friends that you talked about. Um, so for any students who are older and who are having experience in another industry and trying to switch, even if they're only started at the bottom, do you have any advice for that kind of person? I would say just be able to articulate why that like people people are so curious. Why are you switching from being a lawyer to a writer? Like, like, and it's not just like I hate my job. It's like why are you passionate about changing industries and knowing that you're going to have to start from the bottom? Like, if you're able to articulate that, people will understand. People and people will respect that. I feel like. And, and I think it's valued because a person like that brings a level of maturity, mm -hmm. brings a level of experience perhaps not in the actual field um, or, or industry that you're coming into, but those two and, and the level of patience, priceless sometimes, yeah, very priceless. Totally. Yeah. As I mentioned, a lot of skills are transferable. So even if it's not specific to the job that you're looking at, knowing that you have a broader skill set, that's something I would value versus someone that has no experience in it. Um, when, when I was saying that I, w I dreamt about transitioning to scripted programming, for me it was always drama. That's what I wanted to work in. That's what I, I never for a minute thought I was going to be working in comedy. And for a year I was looking for a job because I had been an assistant for so long and I, I wanted to make the switch. And I got an interview for a comedy job and I was like, well, wh why would I go do that? I have no comedy experience. And I met over there because you take every interview. That's another, that's another thing. Any interview you never know. Um, and I met over there and I, I thought they were really cool, but there's no way that they were ever going to give me the job. And after three rounds, they called me and offered me the job. And I said, thank you. And I was really excited. And then I stopped for a second. And I said, just to be clear, you know, I've never worked in comedy. I don't know any comedy writers. I don't know that I can do this. And they're like, yes, that's exactly why we're hiring you because you bring a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Everybody in our department has been nothing but comedy. You've been nothing but drama and we need a new perspective in the department. And I thought that was really cool and I'd never heard that happen to anyone before and be told that specifically. So I think just having experience is something else and is sometimes very helpful. Let's go, let's go here. 
Um, so what is your favorite part about your job, highlight of your day, um, <coughs> what aspects make you love what you do, and then ultimately do you see yourself like moving up or do you feel like you already have your dream job and you're really confused? <coughs> <laughs> what I love about working at E is every day is, you know, different. We always have lots of different fun things going on, whether it's, you know, going out to interview talent, like a couple weeks ago. Like, I'm not really into the WWE, but because I cover Total Divas, I'm really into the show. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I got to go to lunch with all the divas. I was living someone's dream, but no, but it was a lot of fun. And I got to, you know, have lunch and interview them and write exclusives for the website. Um, in a couple weeks, um, E is venturing into scripted TV as well now, um, so we're going to have the show The Royals coming out with Elizabeth Hurley, which is sometime in like March 2015. Um, so we're going to be meeting with the cast and you know interviewing them. So so that's fun. You never know who's going to come into the office. Sometimes we'll have random fun surprises. Like a week ago, it was the 30th anniversary for the movie Ghostbusters. So they had people come in dressed as Ghostbusters and deliver <laughs> special edition Krispy Kreme donuts to the office. So, I mean, you just never know. So things like that are a lot of fun. I get to write. I'm just really happy to be doing what I'm doing. I get to find new ways to create content and, you know, people are reading it everywhere. <coughs> um, in terms of where I'm at, um, you know, it's my first year at E, so I still have a lot of growing to do. I would love to stay with the company for an indefinite amount of time and hopefully move my way up the editorial ladder, you know, one day becoming senior editor. Um, but, you know, we'll see in a couple years. I may, you know, I may not have any more opportunities there and I may decide that that's the time to move to another, you know, media place. So you just kind of have to see where you're at, but yeah. Um, I, working at a big network has a lot of fun things associated with it. You get to go to lots of parties um, and you get to meet a lot of cool, famous people. Um, I think one of the highlights was uh, in May we went to New York and I got to go watch Saturday Night Live um, from Lorne Michaels' office. And oh. you're sitting in there and I, and I was like, yep, this is, it's not going to get any better. <laughs> so to the answer, yes, it's my dream job, but I do feel like there's so much more to learn and so much more to grow and hopefully I'll be doing it um, at Fox for a, a couple more years at least. Um, but yeah, it's, just a, it's a, lot, a lot of cool perks associated with it, but it's also so much work that it's, it's just both. You get, you get the perks, but it's also a lot of work. I'm, not, I'm trying to make sure that I'm not saying that it's all flowers and fun, because it's not. It's very stressful. <laughs> yeah, very, very, very much so, but yes, no, no one day is, is alike. Um, like I was late today, and apologies for that, but I was in El Segundo because our master toy licensee um, our partner who does the actual Minions toys was revealing to us our, the 2015 line of toys. And I had to go take a look at them and play with them because we're going to do a TV spot, we're going to do a bunch of marketing and advertising around it, but I needed to get familiar with the toys. I'm like, okay, okay, let's go, let's go. Yes, they talk and they spin and they're doing a bunch of fun stuff. Let's go, let's go. But I mean, things like that are, to, to me, are still pretty cool. And, and I think the, the moment I know I need to get up and go is when I think that stuff isn't cool. But the premieres and the luncheons and... Um, you know, meeting with talent and, um, you know, dealing with them one-on-one. -on -one. To me, that's still exciting. I'm walking down the lot and I, you know, I see a celebrity, not, you know, run up and get their autograph, but I, I still kind of geek out over stuff like that. Oh, a free t-shirt. Okay, it's still, I'm kind of maybe over the free t-shirt, but, but I'm such that people know to give me the freebies because I sent them over to my old high school for premium. So you just, you kind of know to be a little resourceful. Uh, so that stuff to me is still cool. I mean, I'm massaging my tendonitis right now um, because, you know, you will get vitamin D deficiency because you don't go out for lunch long enough. You know, your bones will start failing. But um, you know to stick with it because you'll like it. That's worst case scenario. Your bones fail is worst You'll case. develop rickets, but, um, but I like it. And so far, so good. Will I stay here for another 10 years? I, I don't know. Is this my dream job? It's what I like to do now, and I think I'm kind of good at it, so I'll, I'll, stick, I'll stick with it. But who knows? Still open. I'm going to be hit you up for some free Minions toys. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Right. So um, 
Disney's awesome, and uh, probably my favorite perk was I got to cover the uh, opening of the summer for Disney Parks this year, which was called um, Rock Your Disney Side, and the park was open for 24 hours, and we got to um, go with talent starting at 5 a.m. Uh, in Florida and go through Disney World and then fly back to California and go to Disneyland and finish the day That's and spend 24 hours <laughs> in the parks. That's really cool. <laughs> so Disneyland and you're with celebrities getting escorted around, not a bad thing. Uh, but actually my favorite thing is when we have new talent come in and we do a live Twitter party and you get to interact directly with the fans who get to talk directly to their favorite celebrities and see the joy that you're bringing to somebody. And you're seeing these questions come in and they get to talk to their favorite stars and they're getting retweeted by Disney Channel and it's they'll literally write back, you've made my life. And, and the, the joy that you're directly talking to a consumer, we're one of the few businesses that actually, business needs that actually get to do that besides research and talk directly to the fans. So that's kind of cool. Who's next? Let's go here. Then no. Okay. Um, my name's Brittany, by the way. Um, I just have a quick question that because you guys are Annenberg alumni, whether it's undergrad or grad, what was the number one skill that proved to be like most invaluable to you learning here or like the class that just really stuck out and you like kind of refer back to that, you still keep in touch with that professor and kind of how those skills have impacted your careers thus far? Um, well, I took a lot of, you know, entertainment-based classes, you know, everything from advertising to, you know, sports and communication. But, and while a lot of them were very, they were all very interesting, but I found that the classes that helped me the most, besides obviously my, any of my writing courses, creative writing and such, were public speaking. Because I do a lot of, you know, we'll, we'll have meetings, I do presentations. It even helps you just when you're interviewing for a job, knowing how to speak to someone else. And argumentation as well, a debate. Those were just all good. You know, sometimes I use that when I want to convince my boss or something, you know. You just kind of come up with ways to communicate something without being too, you know, direct or bold. So. Same answer. Yeah. Was my speech class here was my favorite because I was most terrified of it, and that was the one class that I yeah. really did not want to take. And then it ended up being so much fun, and like I had a I had a great teacher and um, made great friends. And that was the, that's the class that I always think back on and be like, oh, that's when I started like opening up a little bit and like really being able to like just talk to people. I think my favorite class was with Professor Trope, Allison Trope. Am I saying her? Yeah, it's Trope. Um, and it was, uh, God, I think it was gender advertising and gender or some, something yeah, to I that effect. That class. Yes, yeah. love that class. It has <laughs> nothing to do with what I do now, <laughs> partially. But even now, when I, you know, take a look at creative or I'm approving print ads or, or marketing pieces, mm -hmm. it's who is this? Who is this going out to? Who's going to see it? What message are we sending? Um, it, so it's, it's fitting all of those pieces, but love having taken that class um, from like a theory-based perspective. So that was, that was a fun class for me. And then um, uh, Professor Sir Ken Serino's class, and it's, uh, I think it was like his panel discussions where he would bring in um, different newsmakers and notables uh, to the class and just different <coughs> perspectives. Um, th those two were my favorite. He was an awesome teacher. I loved him too. Yeah. yeah, he's great. And mine was probably um, Hollings he Hollingshead's um, integrated marketing class. I'm actually still a judge for those presentations. Um, but it, you actually learn how to help a failing brand, and you have to look at it literally from every angle and put together a plan of things that you have no idea, like how much a commercial costs to make. And um, you have to come up with an advertising plan, creative, and all aspects of it. So it's a really good tool to understand if you're interested in marketing, all the different facets that play into what a marketing plan is. I, I fear most of my professors are retired or, or, or maybe dead. But, uh, there weren't a lot of classes here that translated directly into what I do now, but anything that helped me analyze new things. Uh, and we talked about digital. Uh, you know, that, that wasn't something we talked about, but when you can take a step back and look at how a new technology can impact people around you, it at least gives you a base uh, framework to start analyzing things. And I would also say, you know, don't, don't be afraid to take a marketing class, don't be afraid to take a business class, because everything goes down to business these days. So don't, uh, you know, don't be afraid to, to go over there a little bit. Where, where do we go? 
Let's go. I think you and the blue are next. All right. Hi, I'm Samantha Goldberg. Thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, one thing that one theme that's been kind of recurring is how the digital transition is changing everything from the entertainment industry to the changing media landscape. And I'm wondering, like, from our generation of graduates, what kind of new skills are your companies missing, or where are the jobs? that maybe haven't been created yet, going to? What skills can we develop, either technical or more abstract, that you guys want when you're recruiting new talent these days with the, everything changing so much? Um, I would say writing. Yeah. Writing. Um, go, going back to how everything is a sound bite and everything is so brief, and keeping everything within a certain character count, the actual um, art and and overall putting together of idea in a written piece is lost. Um, I think our interns are, are really good, but if to your point about what you can really hone in, what can you really practice is writing. Mm -hmm. Whether it's, it's a comprehensive email, whether it's um, a program overview, whether it's a recap, whether it's, it's all very written based. Um, and I would love to see that exercise a lot more, at least in my department. And then another thing that I wish I would have focused on a little bit more, and not mastered, but at least I've gotten the fundamentals of, is Photoshop. Not that, at least, again, in my department, uh, not that we require somebody to come and touch up pictures or, or lay out an entire spread. That, that's not the level that we would need, but very basic, like Photoshop basic, cutting and pasting, maybe quick overlay. Things that, that we actually pay graphic designers to do now because we need things turned around so quickly, if we have those skills in-house, again, you're golden. And I can echo that. We need people to just be able to put a logo on a picture sometimes, yes. basic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, presentations, specifically Keynote. Wow. Is like we have, everything is based on a deck at Disney. Mm -hmm. so. If you can put together a beautiful deck that has some cool animation, you will impress. <laughs> Who's next? Let's see. You and then you. Then that. Oh, um. Well, hang on. Uh, oh. uh, leopard print. There we go. Oh, uh, yeah. So I wanted to ask because I know that um, entertainment industry is really competitive. So, like, did you have to face a lot of rejection, like, when you're applying for jobs and stuff, and how do you like handle that? Oh yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I I can't even remember the interviews I had, and like I mentioned before, you will go out on a lot of interviews, but they're great practice mm -hmm. to, you know, you can kind of figure, okay, I won't say that next time, or oh, they asked me that mm -hmm. question, and, and you kind of notice a trend in interviewers, and, um, but as you, you know, as you go on, you just have to kind of stay pop stay positive and it's all all you need is that one yes so I find that you know it, I don't even remember how many no's I got but I have the job I want now and you just have to kind of be open-minded send your resume out do it every day sit down you know be adamant search the job listings ask around with your friends I found that the USC um, UTA job listings were great for me they I'd get them a couple times a week and that's how I got a lot of my internships and jobs so just Keep an eye out, look around. There's so many different avenues you can go down, whether it's a recruiting agency, the actual website for the company you want to work at, or if you know someone who works somewhere. So, I've interviewed at every major studio and only had jobs at two. And I think you just have to remember that it probably wasn't the right fit for a reason, and it could be on both sides. Like, I've had some interviews where I realized on my end I wasn't impressed with either their culture or the personality of the person I was interviewing with. And so, it was a mutual decision. Um, so just know that when it's the right fit, it will, it will present itself. Getting, getting that first job is kind of a battle of attrition. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you got to keep going. Other people, you know, they're going to quit. They're going to drop out this second or third time. It's like, this isn't for me. You got to keep plowing through. Right here. Me. Yep. Awesome. You, you had um, your hand up. My name is Christine. Um, as a neuroscience student, I'm curious to know, uh, really honing in on what you guys actually do, what is your greatest stressor uh, for each of you? So you're, you're too smart to work in entertainment. <laughs> so. Please don't. It's like, you know, it's like finding like the lesser of the evils, like because every everything has its good and everything has its bad, and you know we hear a lot of good, but everything has a challenge with it too. So that's what I'm curious about. Seven hours a day, I have meetings. So actually when I have to do my work is really difficult to fit in there and it causes a lot of stress because people are wanting answers and you're in meetings the whole time and it's 
you're trying to double duty and it gets really difficult and then you work long hours. <laughs> I think what stresses me out the most is uh, a huge component of my job is giving notes to producers and really figuring out, you know, a, a lot of people are not great. A lot of people turn in things that are just not good and <laughs> you have to figure out the right approach in giving them creative feedback that will help and hopefully help the project, but also speak to them in a manner that's still respectful. And I think coming up with the right words to say is always stressful for me, um, but you get through it and you have to do it and most of the time it's fine. Other times you're like, ah, I tank that notes call. <laughs> and then you have to call someone back and apologize. It happens. Yeah. Um, I think mine is balancing um, all of the global requests and all of the global emails because my inbox is going off at all hours of the day and it's training myself to put the, uh, the iPhone away and turn off the ringer because I can easily be up at all hours of the day sending one sheet, approving creative, but it's, it's balancing that work-life balance and knowing when to turn that off but knowing that you don't want to fall behind the moment you get into the office and, and fire up your laptop. Uh, so work in progress. I think for me it's just continually finding new ways to be creative. You know, I mean, if you're writing about, you know, the, you're focusing on the Kardashians for three months and you have to come up with new ways to, you know, new story ideas or, you know, what can we write or ask, ask him about or something. So it's just kind of being innovative, working with your team, and coming up with ideas outside of the box. But, you know, overall, I think you grow as you do it, and it's, it's a lot of fun. So I don't really, there aren't too many cons. I, I'm happy to be there at the end of the day, so, you know. I get a ratings report card every morning at, at 5.30 a.m. You know? Sometimes your day sucks even before you get in the shower. It's, it's, it's brutal. Yeah. But on the other side, when it's good, it's you know you're, you're walking on uh, you're walking on sunshine the rest of the day. Who uh, who's next? Um, so speaking on how the lines are kind of blurring in jobs descriptions and departments. Um, okay, from as you know, a newly grad, I'm graduating this May. Um, what advice would you give to? you know what jobs you should take because obviously I want to apply for everything. Um, I'm a broadcast major so I can do anything from network news to um, communication to publicity. Uh, what jobs do you kind of know like okay I should take this or okay I shouldn't take this my resume is gonna look all over the place. Well, if you're getting a job right out of college, you take that one. Yep. <laughs> that's the right one. <laughs> that's, that's the right one because especially if you're taking something within your industry and it's not exactly what you want to do, just you know, get your foot in the door and like meet people in that department that will help you go to the other department. And if you're fortunate enough to be weighing different opportunities, then again, I think I, think I said this before, just go with, go with your gut on what you want to be doing. But whatever job you're going in for, you better make that person believe that that's the that's your dream job. That's the, you, you, you may not, you may not. Yeah, I don't know, but you better tell that person because if we if 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 you're coming in and you're like, well, I'm looking at lots of things, we can smell that. There's right. there's gonna be somebody right somebody who really wants that job that it is their dream job, and we're gonna give it to them. And if you have sort of an inkling of what it is you want to do, whether it's you know you want to be a publicist or um, you know a news anchor. You know, kind of examine that industry. See what the, you know, the starting positions are. Like, you know, maybe you'll want to look for a job as a writer's assistant or as an assistant at the news desk, or you know, and kind of go from there. And then you can figure out your path upwards. I don't know how long we're supposed to go here, but uh, what do you think? A couple yeah, more. We can take down yeah, maybe like two more questions. Okay, two more. First Dan. you, sir. All right. Uh, Therese, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. Um, going back to like, the stressor question, um, <laughs> uh, how would you guys figure that that stress or that daily hardship has allowed you to progress in your career? Well, politics plays a huge role um, in my business. I have to interface with all the divisions at Disney, so it's really maintaining relationships. So as long as my stress is not being 
focused on the people that I'm working with, then it's the business is still moving forward. It's when I get to the point where I feel like I don't have time to talk to someone or give them the answer that they need and I start becoming short with my answers that I realize I need to take a step back and make sure the relationships are the most important thing and then I can worry about the other stuff later. I thrive on stress. Like, like a crazy day for me is much better than a boring day. And I think when I'm really stressed out and have to do 10 things at once, it gives me the tools for later for learning new things and figuring out how to solve new problems. And then when it's less busy, I can actually apply those things and finish work more efficiently. And I also think of the benefits in related to, that are related to the stress. For instance, the idea of you know, upsetting your boss or having him be mad at you is a stress. But then the benefit of that is if you do the opposite, you'll impress him. So you know, I'll, I'll think of ways that I can you know, impress my boss and work hard and put in the hours and figure out what I need to do in order to you know, ensure that our relationship is good. And, Everything is going great at work, so there's no there's less stress because my boss knows that I'm on it, and you know I'm always on time. He doesn't have to worry about me, so then he's not like le you know staring over my shoulder. He he knows that I've got it, so that kind of makes you know the working situation easier once you reach that level of like trust with your with your boss. All right, last one. Somebody wants it. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to go back to the transition thing. Um, you spoke about that it's important to get your foot in the door. But, um, again, you spent three and a half years doing something that wasn't exactly what you wanted to do, and then you wanted to transition. So, if you look back, sure, you got experience and things like that, but then you could have saved three and a half years by just being in the department that you wanted to do. So how easy is it to transition or, you know, w again, when you're applying, you want to go... <coughs> You want to end up in a particular department, but then you're saying apply to everything. And, and that makes sense, but again, when you know where, you think you know where you want to go, shouldn't well, you just focus on that? Yes, but sometimes you can't get that job. Like, and like I said to you guys, I, I wanted to be in drama, and while I was at the CW, for, I interviewed for a year and a half to, to get that next, to, get the, to move up to the next step. And I was only interviewing in drama jobs, and I, I, I was getting that you don't have enough experience, or... Uh, we're looking for somebody, whatever it was. There were so many different rejections, and I decided I had to open it up a little bit um, to really make that next step. So sometimes you just can't find, sometimes there's just no availability when you're looking for a job, um, and sometimes you just get a job that you can't refuse. So when I was called two weeks before graduation and someone offered me a job in reality, I was going to take that job because then who knows how long it would have taken to get the, that next job. And another another point, I was interviewing uh, with Sony in reality and HBO in scripted. Obviously, I wanted to get the HBO job, but Sony called and offered me the job, and HBO said it was going to be a couple more months before they made the decision. I had to go with the job because I didn't want to be unemployed. Um, so it's it's all a case by case basis, and depending on where you're at in the moment. I think, I think you want to be in the general direction you yeah. want to go. You, you can't, you're, yeah. you're, you're not in the position to be so fussy. You know, I, I've always wanted to be in scheduling, but you just don't walk into a scheduling job. Right. You know? So I got into research, which kind of led me to scheduling. You know, it just, you know don't go the opposite direction, but you know, try to stay close. You just and have to hope that it yeah. ends up in that direction. Right, and yeah. it's okay to, to stick with it. It's so funny to, to hear you having said, oh, I was an administrative assistant for three years, and then you heard some of the gas like, oh, I would never, an admin for three years, not me. It's okay if you if you are if you are an admin for three years, and that's great that that entry level position, recent graduates come in with with so much ambition and, and they have a vision, that's great. But if in a year, two years, three years they still haven't moved you, but you know you're valued, you know that you have open communication with your with your boss, and and there's a plan for you, it's okay to stick with it. It's not the end of the world that you don't have the title, that you don't have the corner <coughs> office yet, or that your window do, or that your office does not have a window. Stick with it. It's it's okay. Sometimes loyalty pays off. And and I, I would just like to add that I was in and I was an assistant for close to seven years, and many many times I thought, well, this is obviously not going to happen for me, and I'm going to give up. And um, 
then I would think, well, what else do I want to do? And the answer was nothing. And I just kept working for it. And one of my bosses told me, you're getting all these rejections because you're waiting for the right one. And when the right one comes, you'll know. And then six months later, I got the job that I'm in now. And she was 100% right. And I think about that all the time. And I give that advice to other people is, you're going to get rejected because the right because you're waiting for the right job. And when the right job comes, you'll know. And, and it's tough because your friends will be yeah. getting a promotion yep. and then they'll pull up in their BMW and you're like, you know. And you're like, I'm better than that Yeah, person. and you're like, he's an idiot. You want to kill him, but you, know, you got you to stay the course. For me, when I was interviewing at Disney, I didn't have television experience and I thought that would be my detriment. But they said just because I worked at Universal and I had entertainment experience, that ended up being enough. And my <coughs> jump from consumer products to back to entertainment didn't phase them. So the right job will find your skills useful. All right. Well, uh, I think awesome, awesome advice. Our panel. And, uh, yes. Anything else? Thank you, Kelly, a wonderful moderator. Thanks.